So welcome to this next module. We're very privileged to have with us here today Dr. George Lenberg. He's going to be telling you about the publication process and also giving you some tips about how to get your paper published. So thanks, George. Well, thank you very much for having me today. I, I hope we can say something that might be useful. So I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. George Lundberg. He spent 17 years as editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is one of the highest impact medical journals, as well as all of its archives. So he was there until 1999. After that, he was editor-in-chief of the Medscape Journal of Medicine, which was one of the first open access journals, as well as editor-in-chief of eMedicine at WebMD. He's currently editor-in-chief of CollabX. He's an editor-at-large at MedPage Today, also a consulting professor at Stanford University, serves on the board of the National Library of Medicine. So he has just a wealth of experience uh, in publishing that he can share with us. So, so thanks again for being yeah, here. I've done, a, I've done medical editing now for about 30 years. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm going to just uh, start with a question here. Besides good science, what key elements are journal editors looking for in a paper? They want papers that will make their journal look good. Mm. So one of the key points for an author is to figure out where is the best fit for the product the author is producing in the medical literature. And that is a moderately complicated process, but a lot of authors just want to go for high impact journals because, it, but that depends on what they're looking for. If the author is looking for uh, sensational information, uh, something important for the CV, uh, something that's great to hang the next grant application mm -hmm. onto, that's one thing. If the author is interested in influencing the field, it might be an entirely different journal to pick. Yeah. So, is the author interested in the readership? Who does the author want to have read the journal? I mean, the readers, readers read some journals, they don't read other journals. So, a lot of this has to do with the matching process between what the editor is looking for, what that journal likes to publish, and what the author is trying to accomplish by the publication. So do you as an editor spend a lot of time when paper comes in sort of figuring out in your own head of is this the right fit for the, the science that was done and it's the I right think fit that for journal? That's what one does actually from the very beginning. If paper comes in, you, you, whatever editor is assigned to handle it. In the big journals there are lots of editors and the editor in chief tries to get that editor who has the most knowledge in that particular subject area to handle the paper. And that editor then is assigned the paper, and that editor, because of that amount of knowledge, has the authority to reject without consulting anyone. And in the big journals, that 50, 60 percent of articles that get right there before they're ever seen by another pair of eyes. There's a risk involved there. What if this editor is biased? What if this editor is not knowledgeable in that area? What if the editor, oh, is arrogant or maybe is in competition with that field or knows somebody else who is working in that field. There are all kinds of human things coming to there, which unfortunately I've seen happen too often. But the, or the usual author ought to trust the editorial process as being in the best interest of science, medicine if it's medical science, patients, the public health, the public interest in general. But it isn't all that hard to get an article into print, but it's very hard to get an article out of print. <laughs> That's a really good so point. So <laughs> the, authors, the authors, especially young authors, should view this issue of the review process, the editorial process, is designed to keep egg off of their face yeah. and be thankful for help. Yeah. In making the manuscript better, or maybe even making it never be seen by anyone else. <laughs> I think that's a really good point, that the viewing the whole publication process as a way to improve your article and improve uh, your... For the paper, reader yeah. and for the author. Yeah, yeah. So that's what the review process is all about. Yeah, good, good. Um, and what do you think is the number one mistake that scientists make when they're submitting their paper for publication? I would say that if they pick the, a proper journal, the best journal for it, which may be the number one mistake, not picking <laughs> okay, the yep, best good. journal and, and being rejected at that point. But yeah. beyond that one, which we've already mentioned, I think writing it too long is okay. a very, very common mistake. 
Another very common mistake is not writing it for that journal by following the instructions for authors. Mm -hmm. All journals have instructions for authors. Some of them publish them every issue. Some publish them once a year. Now in the age of the internet, it's easy to find the instructions for authors. So many authors don't find them, and if they find them, they don't follow them. And the editor can smell that immediately. If this person didn't follow the instructions for authors, the editor wonders, well, if this author can't even follow the instructions for authors, why should I believe the content mm. of the science? Maybe they're not very careful with the science either, so follow the instructions for authors. As I say, try to get the right journal, follow instructions for authors, don't write it too long, and don't draw conclusions that go beyond the data. Point, yeah. That's a very common problem. Good. Sorry you asked for one. <laughs> no, I those are all several, fantastic they're, they're uh, all tips. Yeah. For number one. yeah, great. No, that's a, those are really great. Um, and sort of along those same lines, what can authors do to increase their chances of getting published, you know, in a higher impact journal or, you know, even just getting published if you're starting out? Be humble, but don't be uh, excessively humble. Hmm. Take, be willing to take chances, but realize if you take a chance, you may have to come back and try it again in some other place. Shoot high, but why would you want to shoot for the moon with one of the three or four or five top journals in the world if you really know that your paper isn't quite up to the level that you see published in that journal all the time? So I think, uh, the, the, as I've already said, try to figure out the, the right venue Will there be a, a reading audience that is what you're trying to reach that would be sympathetic to your topic and what you're trying to say? And then follow the instructions for <laughs> authors, really do. Yeah. And once you've weird. done that and tried to write it concisely, that's pretty good. Now, if you have a lot of co-authors, that's good, but it's also hard because they all have to agree yeah. on the final product. If you don't have many co-authors, I recommend that when you think you're finished and ready to <laughs> send that paper in, don't. Instead, stick it in a drawer or on your computer, turn off the computer for a day or two. I know you're really hot to yeah, try, but yeah. let it cool. Then go back and pretend you're the meanest editor in the world <laughs> and see whether you, the meanest editor in the world, really think this is a really good paper. And if not, see how it could be made better. And then choose your own reviewer at least one or two whom you know and ask them to tell you what they really think about the paper. And then when they tell you, remember you ask them to tell you <laughs> what, what yeah. they really think about the paper because you want them to tell you the truth so you can make the paper better. Those are some of the hints on the early side. Yeah, that's great advice, I think, spending that time to go back and look at it. We've been talking a lot in this course about being concise, so also going back and cutting down your work and having somebody else read it to get that outside right. uh, feedback. Yeah, yeah. it's great. real. And um, I was hoping you'd give some advice, especially to young scientists. So since a lot of the class are, are younger scientists are kind of just starting out having the first experiences with getting trying to get a paper published, is there some advice specifically for, for the younger folks in the class? Well, the young scientist who wishes to be a scientist uh, obviously knows it's publish or perish. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of people publish and they perish anyway. <laughs> but that, that's a non, another side of the story. But uh, be suitably in awe of the scientific enterprise so that you're very careful, but don't be excessively put down by it. Because if you have confidence in what you're doing, and others around you who have knowledge about it and who are honest also have confidence in what you're doing. Uh, don't be afraid, but also don't expect to hit the moon the first time. <laughs> yeah, so one of the uh, questions I wanted to ask you is to give some advice. Let's say you're a first-time author and you get rejected. Uh, you know, is there some, some encouraging words you can give for a first-time author who gets uh, the first thing they submit gets just sent down back as an outright rejection. No one likes rejection. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone experiences it. Uh, well, for example, I tried to get into medical school three years in a row before I was finally accepted <laughs> to medical school. And I didn't like that rejection, but I figured I really wanted to be a doctor, and I figured I had what it took, but the, yeah. the admissions committee just didn't understand that yet. 
So you go back and figure, what did I not do the way it is? How can I make things better? So accept rejection as a real likelihood. When you look at a journal, a high-impact journal like New England Journal Jam or The Lancet, you're looking at rejection rates for unsolicited manuscripts on the range of 95%. 95%, wow. Yeah. So most likely the people who are watching us talk know a little bit about <laughs> statistics. And if they're 90, 95%, <laughs> that means it's hard. Yeah. And yeah. it is hard. Uh, the, the journals that are not that, uh, that hard to get into have much lesser rejection rates, yeah. all the way up to rejection rates in the 5, 10, or 15 percent <laughs> range. But mostly those journals won't tell you that, and mostly you don't have any good way to know. Right, right. Because there's, unfortunately, there's not a lot of transparency in the publishing process. Right, right. But can you can assume for even for a moderate impact journal that the rejection rates are likely fairly The rejection rate is going to be a majority of papers that are submitted to it. Okay. Uh, in a moderate impact journal. I think it's journal. helpful for people to know what yeah, they're getting you, into. But when you talk about impact journals, you're, you're coming into a very nebulous area. Yeah, yeah. What does it mean for impact? <laughs> There's uh, People like to have numbers to put yeah. on things, like if you're looking out in the morning and you see what kind of day is it going to be. A lot of times you see, well, there's a 94% ch chance of rain today. <laughs> on the other hand, the sun is shining. Well, what does that really mean? I'm yeah. not sure. But impact factor is something that Gene Garfield created a long time ago, and he wished he hadn't, because <laughs> it puts a number on an article, a number on a journal, that really is, is not that important, but it has grown into a measuring stick for journals, for authors, yeah. and for papers at some level. So to me, an impact has to do with does it change the field? Right, right. Not do a lot of people read it and quote it because it was wrong and they had to <laughs> right, which put would also it down, increase your and, right, but it was stimulating yeah, and interesting. Yeah. So, but nonetheless, uh, there, there's a, a range of journals in terms of the, the level of difficulty in getting right. into them. And I think it's natural uh, for people who are naturally competitive to want to get into journalists the hardest it can be, <laughs> in part because, hey, there's a big mountain, I'd like to climb yeah. it, and in part because they know their colleagues and their future potential employers are going to know, wow, yeah. it was that hard to get in there, uh, that person got there. I know that when I ran the JAMA uh, journals, which included the Archives of General Psychiatry, that journal had an acceptance rate so low and, a, and a, re, uh, a, a review process so long and tedious that it had become such that if a person in those days could get one paper published in the Archives of General Psychiatry, you could probably get tenured. Wow. <laughs> so that was a mystique. Yeah. But there were yeah. also data to support it because everybody knew it, it was really, hard to get it. Yeah. Really yeah. happened yeah. that way because it was so hard. But that was in part because Danny Friedman, the editor for a very long time, commonly would have 12 to 15 peer reviewers oh, that's per very unusual. manuscript. And yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. On the uh, flip side of that, just so uh, you know, people who are just starting out understand, so you've mentioned the, the rejection rates in a lot of journals are very high. How often does something just get accepted outright, just to give people a sense of what they're looking at? About the only time a, an article gets accepted in a good journal outright is if it was solicited by okay. the editor. So you're usually looking at one of these reject but resubmit <laughs> uh, kind of where you're... Beyond yeah. that, it's you, you, you're looking at one... Well, no, what an author is going to get, by and large, is a... If the author is lucky, they're going to get a list of, of suggestions and criticisms right. which say that this paper is important, this paper is interesting, uh, this paper seems to have valid data, this paper seems to have conclusions that do not go beyond the data. The subject matter is timely. It's subject matter of interest to the readers of the journal, I'm the editor speaking on that now, and it's timely. So we'll give it a priority. And that's the process the editor goes through okay. with the reviewers to help decide whether this paper gets rejected instantly or accepted with minor revision, which does happen, does but happen not often. Yeah, okay. Heavy scientific papers rarely get accepted with minor okay. revision. There's usually rather a lot of revision. Right. Commentaries, viewpoints, uh, 
opinion pieces, invited editorials, mm -hmm. uh, things like that can get accepted with very sure. little change sometimes. But I don't think I ever wrote an editorial for JAMA myself that got accepted without revision. <laughs> so that's good to know. Remember that. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was the editor. <laughs> yeah. But I, so I was generally intelligent enough <laughs> and humble enough to let somebody else look at my stuff yeah. before yeah. I publish it because uh, I, I want somebody else to see yeah. it. And fortunately, that kept egg off my face most of the time. Right, Not right. Always. So, um, in terms of if you get one of these back where there's a lot of revisions that are requested of you and maybe it hasn't been ex you know, rejected but with the chance of resubmission, what is an author or a journal editor looking for when they get a paper back? I mean, what's the, you know, how, um, what are some tips for how to respond to reviewers and, and is there some, some kind of uh, bar that you have in terms of like, what, is it ha what do the authors have to achieve? Well, first <laughs> off, the authors should be very pleased if the journal that they want their paper published in comes back and says, we're interested in this paper and if you will do this, 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 and this, we'd be happy to look at it again, but it is subject to additional review. Yeah. Many authors think they make the jump, the assumption that if they do what they're told to do, it will be accepted like that. No, it's always subject to additional review, but it's encouraging. Yeah, yeah. If an editor sends back uh, such a review and has two, three, four reviewers, all of whom anonymously usually have listed what they think about the journal, about the article, and, and how it can be made better, and the editor has decided that these things can be encountered, they can be dealt with. Now, the author doesn't have to do everything the reviewers say because the author may disagree strongly with some points, but the author either has to do everything the reviewers say or has to argue effectively as to why they did not do what the reviewers said. And then that's okay. But to do this, all of the authors, if there are many, although hopefully there'd be one who would take the lead, need to go through the reviewer comments and in the process of making the revision, write a cover letter for the revision that takes every reviewer comment and indicates how it was dealt with. For example, we did this, page two. Or we didn't do this because this reviewer really doesn't understand the science is different from what that reviewer would think. See this reference. Yeah. Or something Very like specific. that. Yeah. Item by yeah. item so that the cover letter could become as long as a manuscript, but <laughs> the, the editor is going to look at that and going to see, oh, this was well done. But you better do what you say you did because the editor is going to go back and see yeah, if that's you a good really point. did yes. <laughs> what you say you did. I have to tell you, Kristen, sometimes authors don't. They said they did it, but if you check I it, have reviewed they papers really didn't do where that. That's been the case, yeah. Now, the stupidest thing <laughs> an author or group of authors can do, in my view, is to take a manuscript that's been rejected but has been encouraged to be mm -hmm. revised, get angry, uh, get on your high horse and say, I know better than those reviewers, I don't want to go there anyway, we'll, we'll send it to another journal. And it's so much trouble to go through all those revisions, we're just going to send it on to another mm -hmm. journal and see how it goes there. It's really stupid for a lot of reasons because most likely those reviewer comments are useful and can make the paper better. And second, it's entirely possible that that second journal is going to send the article to the same reviewer <laughs> who right. saw it the first time. And I've had uh, articles come back, uh, me, the editor from reviewers said, I already I reviewed <laughs> this paper for the whatever, whatever <laughs> journal, and I s recommend that it be right, revised and at value, but there had to be a lot of changes. And I can't, it looks to me like they haven't done anything. That editor kills that paper so fast, no chance, okay. over. So you have to be, if you're not going to make a revision on it, you're going to have to be awfully lucky about where you send it the <laughs> next time around. And you're really stupid if you do that. <laughs> That's very good, too. And um, what uh, key changes do you anticipate are going to occur in the publication process over the next decade? I think we're sort of in a, an era where, the, where a lot of things are changing, and I was hoping to kind of see, uh, get from you what you think it's going to look like. Yeah, Dylan is going to be in, in San Francisco uh, later this month. Dylan Bob, not Dylan Thomas, the great Welsh poet. When the time they are changing. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, change is everywhere, uh, and most people are caught up in it and yeah. trying to figure out what's happening. 
in the publication process, the futures, I mean, predictions are hard to make, especially yeah, about yeah, the future. Of course, yes. <laughs> but it's going to change. Yeah. We know that for yeah. sure. Uh, second, my view is that open access publishing in science and medicine will become the rule, not the exception. Right. If you gave me a 10-year time frame, I'd say by 10 for sure, okay. perhaps even earlier than that. Uh, the, the recent rebellion by uh, people, especially in the UK and the Harvard faculty and others against those uh, for-profit publishers that have been charging libraries so much money to keep their subscriptions going uh, it, it has shaken the publishing industry while they've tried to ignore it for a long time. So open access publishing, of which I'm pleased to have been a pioneer a, a long yes. time ago, 1999, oh, uh, actually, early on, before the PLOS was even a dream in Harold Morris's <laughs> mind. Uh, and that it's coming, 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 coming. Now, there are costs involved in publishing. You have to understand that, and they're real. But you don't have to make a huge profit like shareholders have required from some of those publishing houses. Some are publicly held, some are privately held, but that's going to shake down. But costs will have to be, uh, there'll have to be a way to find the money to keep yeah. the journals going because there are real costs. Uh, the peer review process has costs. Editors need to get paid, even though peer reviewers <laughs> generally don't. Uh, the publishing process. However, in medical scientific journals, the biggest costs have always been paper and right. the printing and postage issue. And with open access publishing on the internet, uh, you don't have paper uh, and uh, there are production costs because you have to get it up there. And there are editing costs, but they're usually not as high as they are in a print publication. So. Fortunately, if you're going for grants, now you can ask the granting agency to fund the opportunity for open access publishing. If you're paying page costs yourself, it goes way back to the days when authors were asked to pay to a journal in order for a journal to consider a paper, and then it was sometimes just for pictures. Uh, I don't like authors having to pay because I always worry, well, if they pay a lot, maybe there's a better chance <laughs> they're going to get published. And uh, the vanity press concept right. is there. You'd have to be very careful about the ethics and, mod uh, and the transparency of that process. It's going to be open access, and it's not going to be a hold of six months to a year uh, at the National Library of Medicine before people have access to it, because that's not fair. If public funds funded the research, the public owns the data. And to have to pay again to get a subscription to something, I've said is wrong since 1999. Mm -hmm. I made that point at Harvard in 99, and uh, the point is the same. But now people are coming around that point of view. That's the biggest change. Yeah. And with that, speed, speed, speed. <clears throat> and in the process of speed, we don't want to lose quality. Right, and right. That's the big point. That's the big issue, yeah. <coughs> And if you could change one thing about the publication process going forward, what would it be? Make it open access? All open access, yeah. But not self-publishing. Okay. Still have the peer review. There are people who like the idea of self-publishing, and I can understand that. Say, post-publication peer review is always the most important peer review anyway. Right. So people could say, well, why don't we just publish anything and let the post-publication process take it over. And I think there's a place for journals to try that, but there should be a due process to the reader up front. So the reader knows this is self-published and nobody's mm -hmm. seen it except the author, and the author wants to have the post-publication peer review process, and then how do you do that in an organized manner? Who, who's the owner? Who's mm -hmm. the publisher? Or is there one? Is I mean, blogging, now, I predicted that blogging would be the end of the world in terms of, of any kind of trust in anything because a blogger is the author, the copy right. editor, the peer reviewer, the final editor, uh, the uh, advertiser, the public relations <laughs> director, uh, all of these things all at the same time. And how can you trust that? I couldn't believe that would ever be possible. And yet, the market is shaking it down so that there are bloggers you can trust and there are bloggers you can't. And that's from post-publication peer review. You look at a, something like the healthcare blog 
And the stuff that appears in the healthcare blog, by and large, has been written by people reviewed by nobody except the editor who does agree or disagree or not agree to publish it. But it can be published very quickly, and then it stands on its own merit with the name of the author. If the author hasn't faked it, that's the other problem. You can fake it. And if there's not an inner shaking down who the real author is, how do you even know it's that person? Right, right. You can fake the whole thing. So I, uh, But I was wrong. Uh, a lot of blogging has worked very well. And uh, so I don't know. Uh, as I say, uh, the future's not that easy. For me. <laughs> yeah, great. But it's going to change, and it'll change a lot. Yeah. And if you can give any last tips to the class again, a lot of people trying to get published for the first few, first time or uh, follow the instructions for authors. <laughs> Try to choose a journal that fits your study, your paper. Try to do what the editor wants you to do before the editor has even asked you, and that's the instructions for authors. And then have a couple of your colleagues or your friends who want to remain your friends tell you what they think before you actually send it in. And then wait and see. Uh, I had the amazing good fortune to send my first paper with three co-authors to the New England Journal of Medicine, first ever and it was accepted wow. <laughs> with very little revision, wow. but it was a spectacular paper based on cases. Yeah. And the cases were remarkable cases, and, uh, and the editor understood that, but that's not what the average author is going to be likely yeah. to experience. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. George Lundberg, for being here with us today. Thank you. I appreciate that very much, and thank you for bearing with us. <laughs>